Morning, everybody. Um, good to be back in the classroom with you all. <laughs> I don't know if it's good for you to be back in the classroom with me, but I'll be with you for the next eight lectures in a row, in which case we're going to be doing transition. We're going to talk about food and finish talking about water, and we're going to talk about uh, extinction, but then we're going to start talking about solutions, which is, I think, an interesting part of the course. It's a, it's a part of the course about which I know quite a bit, and, and, um, um, and so we, we'll talk about um, uh, what the technological solutions are and what the reconciliation bill, the five 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 hundred fifty five billion dollar reconciliation bill that the Dems have outlined um, does. All right, on the path to net zero. So a lot of people always ask me if I'm disappointed, and the answer is no, I'm overjoyed, okay? And so uh, the narrative in the press is that uh, people didn't get what they wanted. It depends on who, if, if what you want to do is solve the carbon and climate problem, and you look at the alternatives of no action relative to what we've got here, uh, this thing could put the nation on the path to net zero or very close. So it's a good deal, all right? It's not the way, it's not the cheapest way to do it. It's not the best way to do it, but it is a way to do it, all right? I'll take anything. Uh, you guys crushed the exam. Good for you, all right? Um, the previous best mean in the times I've taught this, this is the fifth, is with 75 on a midterm. So you guys crushed it. It's good for you. Um, uh, you know, uh, you can think of the mean as a, I mean, it's for the whole course. This is the, the lecture part of the course is the minority of your grade, and this is the minority part of the lecture part of the course, so it's a smallish piece. But, you know, you think about the mean as B plus-ish, right, uh, you know, or so, something in that range, right? And so you have to get really quite a ways down um, uh, to be out of the B range, right? So, so um uh, there are a couple of outliers there. If you're one of those outliers, you really should come see your TA and come see me, all right? We could talk about that. There's nobody on this figure, however dire it may look, that is unrescuable, all right? So, so do know um, we've had every time we've had, had people that are start way back and claw almost all the way up. So this is doable. And we're here to help. I'm here, I'll meet with you, I'm here this week, I'm here next week, I'm here the week after that, and so come see me. Um, there will be, whoops. oh nice, got the good noise. That's really useful. <laughs> um, nope. Yeah, so, so uh, there's the means for each section, and they're the standard deviations and the medians. And you can see that the means for the different sections are really close to one another. The lowest is 82.4, and the highest is 89.6. The standard deviations, though, are 20 or so. You have to divide those by the square root of the sample size to figure out whether or not that's within random variation or not. But if it isn't, we will adjust the different section means so that you aren't penalized for being in a tougher section, okay? But you can see that any adjustment that would happen would be small, all right? You, you don't expect these numbers, obviously, to be the same because of random variation. And the, the right thing to do is to take the standard deviation there and to divide by the square root of the number of people in that section. And then that's the one standard deviation is use, you know, um, two means should be within uh, uh, one standard deviation of each other 60-some percent of the time. And so there are ways to adjust this, and we'll do it. But it's not going to be much, all right? You know, C, section D might lose a point relative to section A, B, or F, depending on how it works out, but it just won't be a big deal. Um, so, so I don't think there's an issue there. Any questions on that? If you have questions about the exam, by all means, come in and talk, talk to me, talk to your, your TA, and we can, we can work on that, all right? Okay. All right, so um, I was in the uh, middle of my water lecture last time, and I'm going to uh, finish the water lecture and then start talking about extinction. Um, we talked about the difference between withdrawal and consumption. Water withdrawals, remember, are such that um, it looks like irrigation 
and uh, industry um, are close to the same users of water. And industry, um, agriculture would like to say that. Uh, but the real story is that, um, this is not advancing on the screen, let's see. Um, the real story is that um, if you look at thermoelectric power, which is almost all cooling for thermoelectric power, which is almost all of the industrial uses, relative to um, uh, irrigation, which is in, so industry is purple. I'm sorry, industry is in purple. And agriculture is in yellow, and households are brown. You can see that the whole story is irrigation. So when the water company in LA tells you that you should skimp on your shower, well, maybe you should, but that's primarily because the water company, because the water system sells water to the agricultural producers in California, not because it sells water to people in LA, most of whose gray water gets recollected and reused, right? So, so skimping on your shower is not is, it doesn't really help the water shortage. It might help a temporary squeeze, but it doesn't help the systemic water problems in places that have water problems. It's irrigated agriculture that does almost everywhere. And this is a reckoning that will have to change. The, the users of irrigation water almost everywhere have historic, closely guarded, um, you know, one voting issue rights that they are loath to give up because it means the end of a lifestyle. You've got to irrigate, and all of a sudden you don't have irrigation water, you can't grow crops there anymore. And so this reckoning is coming for the agricultural sector in places that are historically dry. All right, um, and that means that um, although it's useful to think about your water footprint when you're consuming things, the numbers that you see on sites like this one also include transpiration water from rain-fed vegetation, all right? <laughs> Which, I'm sorry, is going back to the atmosphere anyway. And so, um, so take all of this with a, with a grain of salt um, uh, or, or a whole shaker full. Um, it is also true that um, when the climate changes and we all of a sudden, places that are relying on rainfall that no longer occurs to produce their agriculture um, can, can, will become food insecure, and people will move. But there is a rational thing to do. There, you would think that the rational thing to do would be to, to trade water, but it's not, because water is heavy. Um, uh, uh, but what you can trade is what the water makes. You can trade food. And so the solution to the climate change-induced food insecurity is not local food, it's traded, internationally traded, commoditized food. And so this is actually an important message to onboard. It doesn't mean that in the United States we can't have a local food movement that builds community and does a lot of things. But it does mean that globally that solution doesn't take us through the climate change that's coming. We're gonna have to trade food. Um, we were talking about drought. Remember, there are different kinds of drought. Um, if you're a power plant operator, you're worried about hydrological drought. You're worried about the river getting too low to, so that you can no longer take water into your cooling system, right? And that's a hydro hydrological drought. Um, if you're a, a, a farmer, you're worried about soil moisture drought because that's what your plants see. Um, mostly what they talk about in... The press is meteorological drought, hasn't rained in, you know, how many days, and it's really hot. Um, a lot of drought around the, particularly in, in uh, non-G20 countries, is socioeconomic drought. It is development of areas that had inadequate water for the development that's taken place, and uh, without the infrastructure put in place to do it, without the trading to do it, as the population in those places grows. So, so you can... Think of, even in rain, even in places with good rainfall, you can get into socioeconomic drought because there's not enough clean water for the populations that exist. 
There are spectacular droughts even before climate change. The most spectacular in this country was the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, which occupied a relatively small area here in Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, and kissed into Kansas and Colorado. Um, there are other areas damaged by dust storms, but it's a relatively small drought. It's one in which, though so many records fell, record after record after record after record for high temperatures fell in that one spot, that it still makes the total extreme warming record in the United States look anomalous relative to other countries because there's this big pulse early on in the record and then a big pulse later on in the record, which is caused by climate change. <coughs> but this early pulse wasn't. Uh, other countries don't, don't show that. Um, remember that in the United States, there's the drought we're talking about. Um, these are uh, the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is a measure of, of uh, soil uh, uh, drought. But there have been a lot of droughts, right? Drought is sort of, the drought cycle is relatively uh, common, and there are mega droughts. Most of you probably know that the Anasazi uh, Native Americans and the American Southwest um, entered a civilizational collapse that then, with a rebirth that led to the Hopi, uh, following a mega drought in the American Southwest. The Mayan culture fell, uh, classic Mayan culture fell after mega droughts that occurred in Guatemala. Um, and the Yucatan um, in, I think, right around the 800 uh, present era. Um, so water and climate change. So there, the regional scarcity that we think of as the water problem will rise, both because of decreased precipitation and increased temperatures. Increased temperatures increase evaporative water loss, and so the soil moisture goes down for two reasons. Less water in, more water out. And um, uh, the, the, um, these are uh, IPCC AR6. Remember, this is annual mean temperature change due to one degree of warming. Annual mean temperature change relative to 1850 to 1900. That means that you get, um, that's two degrees, that's one and a half degrees. For one and a half degrees, you get a lot of temperature increase in the far north, which means all else equal, this soil moisture loss is greatest there. The precipitation change, you can see that the dry areas here in the Mediterranean, the American Southwest, uh, Namibian South Africa, parts of, of uh, uh, Australia, but also Southeast Asia gets substantially drier for one and a half degrees. Total soil column moisture, which integrates the two, the increased temperatures and the decreased rainfall, you get the sort of agricultural belt in the Americas getting into trouble even at one and a half degrees, the Amazon getting into trouble even at one and a half degrees, big swath here uh, through the grasslands in um, uh, Argentina and Chile, uh, the Med and the Middle East getting into trouble, China getting into trouble. This is all, this is not good, all right? This is not good. This means you're gonna have to trade, trade food or you're in trouble. That's what this means, right? There's just too many people here, for instance. If it slops over to two degrees, this gets substantially worse. In particular, the Amazon looks like it. To my, I, I know quite a bit about this, and that looks to me like fire. All right, looks to me like losing a lot of the Amazonian forest. Uh, at four degrees, <laughs> you know, all of the, all the rainforests are just black. I mean, they're just they're just uh, they're gone. Okay, so so um, that's the bad news. The good news is um, you. Um, this is a contracted Amazonian rainforest, although it's an augmented Central African forest, if you can, uh, uh, if, depending on what happens there socioeconomically. But even here, the work we do here in um, uh, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab indicates that you'll have Amazonian rainforest intact at the end of the one and a half degrees, and quite a bit of it, too. I mean, like two-thirds to three-quarters. All right. Um, California is always in the news when it comes to water, but he's always talking about California. It's particularly vulnerable. Um, and uh, remember that these are the sources of water, and these are the sources of water that, that California really uses. It uses some, some rainfall, a little bit, right? But mostly the agriculture uses river channels, lakes and reservoirs, and groundwater from the, the first two sources are from snowmelt, 
that comes off the Sierras and also that accumulates during the, the brief winter rainy season, all right, which is non-spectacular in terms of total volume, but it's dependable. And then the groundwater is uh, un, unrechargeable, a lot of it. Uh, it's not, it's, well, it's actually, they don't know in California. The aquifers that contain the groundwater are not fully mapped, so they don't know how fast the different ones recharge and which ones recharge and which ones don't, all right? So three important mo <coughs> notes, melting again of snow in the Sierra is important. Multi-year drought is a problem for reservoirs. They get down below their intakes and much of the Central Valley, which is the breadbasket of um, California, depends on groundwater. Um, snowpack, shown in this slide, these are uh, uh, historical average and forecasted um, uh, uh, under a business as usual scenario. Snowpack is expected to decrease. Um, we see that some years already. Uh, California has had recent multi-year droughts. We're in a drought cycle right now. These will intensify and become more frequent. And so all this bodes ill. And groundwater is being depleted all over the place. These are uh, places in which um, groundwater is being depleted and the warm colors that is not blue are where the groundwater is being mined away. Right, so there's more being pulled out of the ground than is coming into the ground. And some of these are spectacular. So some of these in the Midwest, the Ogallala Aquifer, is from the Pleistocene. It's from 10,000 years ago, and you're just mining it down. Um, and some of them are less spectacular. But you can see the Central Valley here is just being murdered. There's way more that is being um, extracted. Um, then is being added to the aquifers there. Uh, this is the way um, these aquifers work. Water goes into saturated rock and accumulates here. It helps fill um, lakes and, and, uh, and streams, but a lot of it just fills the pores in the rock and you can mine it out, all right? Um, and so if you sink a well, what happens is you pump down the zone of saturation. It gets lower and lower and lower and lower. And so in, Ca in California now, your well runs dry, your irrigation well runs dry, and it's because your neighbor has sunk a new deeper irrigation well that pumps the water past your pump. So then you have to drill an even deeper hole and then you pump the, the water past her pump. <laughs> right? And it just keeps ratcheting down. And so that's, that's the problem. This is obviously an unsustainable practice, and the cost of extracting water then goes up monotonically uh, through time. You might think that this is not that big a deal. Um, oh, here's just some examples. This is Saudi Arabia from 1987 to uh, 2012. This is where it started. And you can see the irrigation water from groundwater, fossil groundwater in Saudi Arabia that is coming in to grow wheat and other staple crops. All right, it's a crazy place to grow, to grow uh, stuff. The, in Minnesota, this is surface water. Okay, this is rain fed. And here, this is in, uh, yeah, that's in Kansas. Those are the crop circles that you see when you're flying over and that's a central pivot irrigation system that's reliant on groundwater. Um, groundwater um, it, loss is spectacular. So I don't know if you can see this well. This is in the Central Valley. The San, well, actually, it's in the San Joaquin Valley in California. And that was the level of the land in 1925. So as you pump the water out, the ground actually sinks away. It subsides. And it subsides a lot. So when I say this is a spectacular change, this is what I mean. The ground is actually sinking away, shrinking, as you pump the water out of it. So that's 1977 and that's 1925, and the ground has fallen that far in about in 52 years' time, okay? Yeah? How do you measure that? Well, so um, among other things, if you have a, uh, a feature on bedrock where it's not sinking, you can measure the height relative to it, okay? So that's the simplest way to do it. Now we have satellite and laser 
uh, altimetry. You can measure, so we have um, instruments that are gravity meters in orbit, and we also have laser um, uh, LIDAR altimeters. A LIDAR sends a pulse of laser light down at the surface and then literally counts the amount of time until it sees that same precise wavelength bounced back. And the time it takes, of course, given that the speed of light is a universal constant, tells you how far the ground is from the satellite, right? A, a gravimetric, a gravity meter, uh, you have two satellites that are staring at one another. It's like the ice satellite I was talking about, the glacier thickness in, in Antarctica. And when a gravity anomaly tugs one down relative to another, they can see the relative positions of the two changing. It's actually a little bit more sophisticated than that because the, the speed of the orbit changes when the radius of the orbit changes, and so they, they get further apart or closer together. But the point is, two satellites orbiting together, looking at one another, um, get tugged differentially by mass near the surface, and you can measure the mass that way. So you can actually measure the groundwater depletion from satellite instruments like that, and you can measure the height depletion from satellite instruments. So we've got maps for the entire Farrican world, all right, like this. And so you can see a drought because they're literally, if you just do the math, if you've got 10 centimeters of rain distributed across a hectare, a square kilometer, let's say, just do the math for how much mass that is. It's a truly stupendous amount of math. Remembering that a cubic meter of water weighs exactly a metric ton, 1,000 kilos. So do the math on that sometimes. You'll be surprised. All right. So what is the connection between population growth and water use? We often hear that you know populations grow uh, too fast for their water use, and that, that is true to some extent but it doesn't have to be true. Um, the population in the United States has climbed monotonically, but our surface water use and our total water use as a, as, a, as, a, as a nation has actually declined despite the rising population, at least since around 1980 or so. And that's because of the shift towards urbanization and away from irrigated agriculture, or if there is irrigated agriculture, because of pressure on the system, more, um, uh, more uh, efficient use of the irrigated agriculture. So, so, um, so when they say that LA is too big for its water supply, uh, again, that's because um, its water supply is used to grow almonds. <laughs> right? that's, what, that's what makes it too big. All right? um, same thing here for water extraction. You can look at this at your leisure. Um, uh, if urban or suburban areas are, replace irrigated agriculture, overall water use uh, goes down. Red means these are places in which water use in the United States is actually decreasing. And you see there are areas of historical groundwater or surface water irrigation, all right, which is now under pressure. Under price pressure, um, uh, and that means less of it, and it also means more efficient use of the water. As we'll discover in another couple of lectures, policy instruments exist that demonstrably decrease water use for irrigation by 10 to 100 fold with no change in the productivity of the agriculture. All right, so it, we really do know how to fix this problem. It's just politically intractable because of historical water rights that have been held. So those are the goals. I want to end this slideshow, I think. Yeah, there we go. Bring up this one. All right. So I want to start talking about anthropogenic extinction. There it is, right? And um, so get your clickers out. Huh? OK. Um, so, uh, so I'll do a poll, right? Uh, and then that's it. Okay, so I've got it started, I think. So where does the extinction of a large mammal species rank as a harm? And you can see those signs, uh, the, the, the four different options that I give you. The first one is greater than, it's, it's, 
it's worse as a harm than 50,000 jobs lost or the death of one child, <laughs> okay? It's less bad than 50,000 jobs lost or the death of one child. More than 50,000, less than the death, less than 50,000, and greater than the death, all right? I'm just curious to know where people think. Uh, and this is a discriminator between people, you know, how much you care about lives versus how much you care about the economy, how important you think the economy is to the, likely, to the livelihoods of people, and how important you think all of that is relative to a species. Okay, so if you'd click that, I'd appreciate it. And I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing here, am I? Oops. Uh, yeah, push the left. Okay. There you go. Now I'm good? Hmm? Where's the pull? I don't know. Reopen? Uh, yes. Sorry, guys. The file can't be found. Okay. Sorry. All right. Oh, no, I'm just going to do it. Hey, do, uh, do, do people feel okay about using their hands here, or is this too, like, too, like, <laughs> squirrely? <laughs> okay, we've, we've had a technological failure. The, like, moral uh, uh, gravitas of this question has overwhelmed the computer system. So here's the question. Is the death of a species worse than 50,000 jobs lost? As people who say, yes, the the extinction of a species is worse than losing 50,000 jobs. Please raise your hand. You can say yes. Okay, so that's most of the people, but not everybody, okay? A lot of people think 50,000 jobs is a lot of people who are suffering, and then, you know, this is an extinction. Now, extinction is forever, but, and this is a mammal species, don't forget, right? Oh, Lord, it's a large mammal. It's not even, <laughs> this is like a big fuzzy animal, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, who thinks that, Extinction is worse than the death of a single child. Okay, now for me, I'm not gonna vote because I can't vote on that, right? But, but I probably agree with you, right? The majority of people think that extinction is worse than the death of a child, but don't, don't make me choose, right? So, so mostly that's the way this has trended. When, when I first started this course, even a few years ago, there was much more tension there, but people now really do view an extinction as a great harm. Right, and it, it, as a as a, an unethical and immoral act, and and that's changed. You know, when this movement changed, I can remember when the Endangered Species Act was under pressure. When I was uh, your age, there was an article that came out in a relatively learned magazine, but it was a magazine nonetheless, and in which a developer kept asking the rhetorical question, what's more important, the loss of a butterfly species or a $200 million golf course? And he was the guy who was going to build the $200 million golf course, but it was going to make a pretty little orange butterfly extinct in Oregon. And he kept using this as a refrain. And and the polling later indicated that it was exactly the opposite because everyone concluded the butterfly was more important than the golf course. But for him, it was obvious that the golf course was more important than the butterfly. So, so this really has, has changed um, and, and continues to. Even in the developing world, there is a real ethic to preserve the species that live locally, even if it costs economic growth, all right? And so, so uh, the underpinnings of that are interesting because it's the extension of, um, well, because it requires um, an ethical system that recognizes the value of, of non-human life and perhaps just to humans, but perhaps intrinsically. And it's an interesting question there. How about a fish? Who thinks a fish species is worth more than a dead kid, <laughs> okay? Fish species, yeah, see? So, so they're fewer than a large mammal, but still a lot of people say, you know, look, it's a fish, right? But it's, but it's a living species and it's just wrong to, to make something extinct. So, so that's my point there. Given all the, given uh, that you all care about extinctions, or most of you care about extinctions, which of the following concerns you most? The loss of ecosystem services formerly provided by the extent species, like pollination or evaporation that increases rainfall, et cetera. 
the loss of the economic value, that is, you could have ground that thing up and used it as a drug later, but you killed them all, um, or the loss of the aesthetic value, like the loss of a great work of art. You shouldn't kill the fish, and you shouldn't burn down the Louvre, okay? It's like that. All right, so number one, who thinks the most, your biggest concern is the loss of ecosystem services? Okay, that's good. Who thinks it's the loss of the economic value of the species? It's like just a couple things. And who thinks it's the loss of the aesthetic value? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm alone with a lot of you people. And it's because I know too much about ecosystem services. <laughs> okay, we'll talk more about that at the end of the lecture. <laughs> I, must, I don't think you should burn down the Louvre either. All right. All right. So the first thing about extinction is that, you know, with global warming, we've got very little track record to fall back on. But we're super good at extinction, and we've been really good at it for a really, really long time, kind of since the beginning. It's what our species does, all right? So these are great extinction events for the, the big, the large mammals. And this is Madagascar, this is North America, this is Australia, and this is Africa. Now, what explains the difference? Now, these are just three places in which we've lost a large fraction of the megafauna. And there, but there's tons of others that I could put on this graph here. We could look at Hawaii, we can look at New Zealand, we can look at the Greater Antilles, and the, we can look at South America. But there are all kinds of places we can look at. And the extinctions occur at different places. And what now, there's all kinds of controversy about each and every one of these extinctions, about what caused it. Was it climate change? How much climate change was involved? Maybe there was an asteroid impact sometime near one of these events, and so on. Or was it hunting? But the thing that unites them all is it's when people with sophisticated projectile weapons show up. Every one of these just happens to coincide with the first arrival of people with sophisticated projectile weapons, all right? And by a sophisticated projectile weapon, um, I mean, for most of these cases, it's an otolotl. An otolotl is a spear thrower. If you have never made one, it's, I'll, give you, I'll tell you how to do it, because it's a lot of fun. You can go make one, and you can take a spear and take it out at some place where there are no people, and you can beat the international javelin record, unlike your third throw, okay? They're really powerful, and they're simple to make. And so this is why um, there are differences. Now, why is Africa different? It's because people invented projectile weapons for the first time here, just over 100,000 years ago with this invention of this microlith technology in North Africa. And you got this little extinction there. But you know, in Africa, the fauna evolved with the technology of the upright ape. It was inventing it. And so they evolved to be afraid at the right distance. Everywhere else, they just stood there and said, you can't possibly catch me, right? <laughs> that was the end of that. OK, so um, any place you go if you were, when you were a kid and went to a museum that showed, for instance, Ice Age animals. Um, so this is a mastodon and a a, ma a mammoth, rather, and a mastodon. A, a, a mastodon is a, eats like baby spruce trees, and a, a mammoth eats grass. Um, this is a glyptodont. Um, this is a, a, a giant sloth. Um, all of these animals were, went extinct uh, upon the arrival of Clovis culture. That's a Clovis point, but that's a real big one. Most Clovis points are about this big, and they're otlottle darts, is what they are. And so, oops, we know that there were people uh, here before that, but when Clovis came, there was this extinction wave as the Clovis point spread down, so too these species disappeared. Some of these are remembered. It's useful to, it's fun to look. I know a, a guy actually is writing a book about this. How many of these species are remembered from, by, you know, by oral tradition, right? Not, not remembered by scientists or something, but actually remembered. And on this page, um, this is the only one that has a strong oral tradition. There are Native American groups in um, 
Southern South America who remember how to kill the rock monster, okay, where you have to stick it and stuff like that. So they remember what a glyptodont is. This is about the size of a Volkswagen. I mean, it's a good sized animal here. Um, maybe the ground sloth. The, 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 there are many species of ground sloth. One of them looks like it survived to maybe five or 600 years ago on the eastern slope of the Andes. And people do remember this hard hide. It had bony osoderms underneath the skin as armor and reddish fur. And they found fur in, in uh, mummified in caves. So looks like this one is remembered as well. Uh, mammoths um, um, survived. Most of them were killed 10,000 years ago, roughly. And there's no surviving memory of that. Uh, there's a population on Wrangell Island that survived until after the Great Pyramid was built, but nobody remembers. Um, these are just some other megafauna animals that are uh, less spectacular. This is a, a, a lemur, big lemur, 150-pound lemur, and it's the small, it's the second largest lemur that was on uh, Madagascar. The biggest lemur was... Um, size of a gorilla. It went extinct when the uh, Malagasy uh, people arrived between 1,500 and 500 years before the present. Um, the, they arrived in waves from South Asia. Uh, there was also a, a large, uh, the largest uh, ratite bird there. That's a moa, but there was a bigger, fatter one there. Um, and there is an oral tradition of this diphthornus in a whole variety of sources because it survived till quite late. Marco Polo actually um, bought some elephant bird feathers in a market in uh, Z Zanzibar, I believe, on his way to uh, uh, China. And if you read his uh, uh, travels, he describes these feathers and he asks the guy where he got them. And the guy gives him explicit instructions for sailing from uh, the from, from Zanzibar to the northern tip of Madagascar. So it's pretty clear what it was. There's also an oral tradition among the Malagasy people that um, if you see one, you might survive. If you see two, you're dead. <laughs> OK, so they were really dangerous. Um, this is New Zealand, where there were also big ratites. Um, all of the moas, there were a whole bunch of species. They, were all, they, they all disappeared. There's no oral tradition of memory The the Maori who who uh, um, uh, killed them 600 years ago. Um, the only animal they, that's extinct, that the Maori drove extinct, um, secondarily, that there is an oral tradition of is this one. Um, this is an eagle that preyed on moas up to 300 pounds, the largest eagle ever. Eagle easily capable of taking an adult human. All right, and so the, the Maori do remember that there was an animal they called the unseen death from above which is almost certainly that, uh, that eagle. Um, there's a group that's actively trying to de-extinct that, to clone it up, because it has a relative in Australia. And more power to them, but I wouldn't like to be part of their legal team, is all I got to say. Um, these are Australian um, marsupials. This is a marsupial lion analog, where the canines are actually incisors. And this is a marsupial a diprotodon. It's a, a a uh, rhinoceros analog. All of these wiped out when the Aboriginal Australians arrived 40,000 years ago. Um, they also um, made extinct a dragon, like a proper dragon. There, there's a Komodo dragon is this large, venomous, seven or 800 pound, 12 foot long lizard that lives on a few of the islands uh, in Indonesia. And there was a similar varanid but that was 3,000 pounds, probably stood like this at the shoulder, that was a dragon. Big forked tongue and you know, poison and come at you. And they killed them all. So don't mess with the Aborigines, probably is the answer. Um, here's a dodo. Dodos were made extinct. They were on the island of Mauritius and were made extinct by Portuguese uh, sailors in the 1500s. Anybody know what that bird is? It's a thing called a terror bird. They lived in North America. You can see that birds, if you like turn your back on them for an instant, they evolve back into dinosaurs. All right, that's what they really want to do. 
they're, you can look in their eyes and know it, right? They're really, they want to get you in their mouth. Uh, so so uh, this guy, it's uh, debated, it may have even gotten the little fingers from Tyrannosaurus. And these were big and wiped out by Native Americans at the end. That's actually a dinosaur, and that's a terror bird. And they are very similar theropods. OK. So enough show and tell on, on uh, humans. So the point is, we've been really good at making things extinct for a really long time. All right. Most of the animals in North America that you think of as the iconic American species, you know, Yellowstone Park, the wapiti, the American elk, the moose. Zill uh, so all of those actually came in from Eurasia after the native fauna was made extinct by the early, uh, by the Clovis culture and other Native American groups that followed them. So there was a massive extinction event, and most of the fauna we have is actually later imports. There are a few that aren't. The American bison changed from a mostly solitary, long-horned animal, much bigger, that evolved short horns and, and uh, herding. As a, and the herding, uh, short horns so that they can pack together. And packing together is one of the first evolved anti-predator defenses when there's something bad after you that is itself territorial. Because if you can all pack yourself together and move around, it means that the ratio of hunters to hunted goes way down, right? And so they changed. They evolved very rapidly and changed body type and ecology in response to extremely successful hunting. All right, so what do we know about extinction times? We actually have some decent data. Um, the species lifetimes average 1 to 10 million years, depending on the group, according to the fossil record. And what that means is that you know fossils appear in the stratigraphy, and then you go farther and farther up in the stratigraphy, and then they disappear, and that gap is a million to 10 million years. And you can compensate for the, you know, the, um, the statistics, you know, that there's a time delay until you pick up the first one by random chance, and then there's a time delay after you've picked up the last one in which they're still around. Um, since 1500. 77 of 5,500 mammal species and 128 of roughly 10,000 bird species have gone extinct. So we have a decent sample size just since 1500 where we have good historical records. So that 77 of 5,500 and 128 of 10,000 with the conservative assumption of a baseline rate of one extinction per species per million years rather than 10, which would give more alarming numbers. We should have seen three or six, three mammal and six bird extinctions during the period since 1500, but instead we saw 77 and 128, which means that we've got 26 times what should have been the random extinction rate for mammals and 21 times for birds, and that's using the conservative one million year lifetime for a species extinction. The numbers are 10 times bigger if you use 10 million years, okay? So it looks like, roughly, um, since 1500, extinction rates, at least for these two groups, have been about 100 times bigger right, than they were in the, in, in the background. Analogous data indicates that over the last 100 years, we've roughly doubled relative to 500 years. So it's an accelerating loss. And that leads to estimates like this one that uh, recent past extinctions are something like, this is a log scale, 100 times more common than they were in the fossil record. All right, That's just from data. It's really simple. All right. The future has to be modeled. And that depends on how we act as a species. Um, as we'll see in a minute, most of the extinctions that have happened to date well, early they were from hunting, and then they were from agricultural conversion of habitat. In the future, we also get climate change. And so most of the estimates for future extinctions put it up another couple of orders of magnitude. And if it gets up there, we're into a truly cataclysmic extinction rate um, uh, that we'll talk about in a second. 
Now, the current state of the biodiversity is shown here. Um, these numbers uh, are the color codes um, uh, mean different, uh, different things. CR, the red, is critical. Orange is endangered. The, t the gray color is vulnerable. Um, then there's another color, which is data deficient. And then they get down to species that aren't uh, least concern and so on. And so you can see that in every group, these are amphibians, cartilaginous fishes like sharks and rays, mammals, reptiles, bony fishes, birds, corals, freshwater crayfish, freshwater crabs, dragonflies, cycads, which you, you've seen many times in dentist offices and pots, conifers, and seagrasses. You know, for any group you want to look at, there is a minority that are endangered or critical. But there's still a substantial number, okay, given how many species there are. And so this is the state of the extinction. It's like most of them aren't critically endangered, but there are still a lot, all right? So that's kind of the way to think about it. If you look here, um, uh, this is the conversion of habitat from, um, uh, it's, and this is the percentage of habitat that's been converted, that's been lost due almost exclusively to conversion to pasture and farmland and cropland. And by biome, so that's Mediterranean forests, these are deserts, those are boreal forests where you've lost very little, nobody farms in the far north in the tundra or the boreal Canadian forests, but there's a lot of farming in tropical and subtropical broadleaf forests, for instance. So over 80% of currently threatened species are at risk because of habitat loss, not climate change, and not hunting. And in 90% of those cases, the habitat loss is due to agriculture. So you multiply those together, and like three quarters of species we're worried about, it's because of habitat loss to agriculture. That's the dominant thing to worry about. If you're going to fix one thing, that's what you've got to worry about. And of course, that rubs up against the food issue, the food security issue, right? Um, that's the geographic distribution of habitat loss, which is roughly the geographic distribution of habitat conversion to agriculture. Um, so all the places where we grow crops are the places where there, that, is, that graph is dark. Um, so, so oftentimes, if you read alarmist literature about extinction, um, and I won't have time to finish this, um, there, is a, there are statements that you run across about how many species are doomed, how many are locked into extinction. And the numbers are eye-popping sometimes. They'll be, you know, 70 or 90 percent are doomed and locked into extinction. And what I want to educate you about is that this is based on a very, very sketchy data extrapolation, all right? And so it's not that this isn't an important problem, it's just that those kinds of statements don't withstand scientific scrutiny, okay? That's the important point here. And the critical piece of this is that you can look at areas of habitat and ask how big is, is a habitat for, for, for kinds of species. The simplest way to do this is to consider islands of different size. All right, just an island. But they could also be islands of, of alpine tundra of different size and so on. And this is the area in square kilometers up to uh, 100 million and down to a tenth of a square kilometer. And you can actually plot the number of species that are in those places. And if it's a log-log plot, so that's 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, and this is a tenth, one, 10, 100, and so on, it's strangely and beautifully linear on a log-log plot, okay? And so this extrapolation is the thing that's used to ask the following question. If I were to reduce the habitat area here by a factor of 10, I would move from here to here, from a million to 100,000 square kilometers. And so I would have species loss from here to here, okay? So it uses this spatial uh, pattern to extrapolate a temporal trend in a particular place, all right? That's what it's doing here. 
It's using this geographic pattern that is extant between area and numbers of species to ask what happens if we reduce the rainforest area, say, in the Amazon. How many species will we lose? And you're reading it off of this graph. We'll talk next time about why that's um, uh, scientifically and statistically not necessarily the right thing to do. Okay. <laughs>